Well, good morning. Hope you all are doing well this morning and uh, having a fantastic day. The weather is beautiful, and that makes me smile. So if y'all would come on in, we're going to sing some praise, sing how great our God is.
Amen. You all can be seated. Well, good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Community Church. And let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, as we gather this morning, it's good to remind ourselves of some foundational truths. And Lord, in that, we rejoice in the truth that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Lord, you did not spare your own son, but you gave him up for God's elect. And Jesus, we thank you that not only did you save us, but you keep us saved. For nothing can separate us from the love of God in you, through you, because of you, and your atoning sacrifice on our behalf. And Spirit, thank you that you intercede on our behalf. Lord, would you make us grateful. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome this morning. If you are a visitor with us this morning, I know we have some here. I've met some already. Then uh, thanks for joining us. We're glad that God brought you our way. And if you're watching online, welcome to you as well. If you are a visitor, uh, you might have gotten one of these when you came in, a visitor card. And if you'd fill that out for us, turn it over on the back. It's got information you can tell us about yourself, nothing too personal that'll uh, expose you other than... Uh, you can give us your email address, and we would put you on our church newsletter list. We send one out. Come on in. If you're in the back, feel free to walk on, walk on in during this time. But um, we would send you our church newsletter once a week, and you can find out more about us that way, what's going on. But if you did fill that out, back in that corner on that glass top table was a wooden box, the larger of those two wooden boxes, if you'd put your visitor card in there. For the rest of us, that's our giving box. Uh, and, uh, and visitors as well, there's a prayer request area you can put on there. And for those who aren't visitors, that small wooden box on that same table is for prayer requests. And there's cards and pins there. And if you have anything that you would like the uh, church leadership to pray over, we would do that in confidence and consider it a privilege to take you before the throne of grace. Four o'clock youth today. Jim, back there. You're not playing today. Jim's usually over there, but he's sitting. He's resting today. So uh, 4 o'clock, youth here today, a uh, reminder of that. Um, I think most of you are aware of this, but if you're not, you know, Justin and Rachel Jackson were here a few weeks ago, and uh, after a, a season of prayer for them, they have determined that God has called them to Ovilla, Texas. I think that's south of Dallas. And uh, Justin has accepted the position there as the lead pastor at Grace Bible Church. And while we are certainly glad for them and for Grace Bible, we are, are sad and disappointed for us. But uh, they think that's where God is calling them, and they're being obedient in that. So um, would you continue to pray for us that God would lead us to the right man uh, to come here and serve? So we very much would ask you to do that. Um, last month, you might remember, we took a special offering. There was flooding in uh, the country of Myanmar, which we used to know as Burma. And we sent $5,000 through the ministry of Little Door International. It's uh, Tom Arnold and, and Curtis Thomas head up here. But we would, we would uh, get an opportunity, or we have an opportunity. If you put those up, Megan, you know, a lot of times we send money to places for humanitarian aid, and you don't get to see what happens. And they sent back a couple of pictures. These are a couple of Jeep loads of food and water and oil being loaded up to send to... Uh, I think in the Chin Hill area, an area that's in the Chin State there in, in Burma or in Myanmar. So uh, just an opportunity to see your dollars at work there in terms of uh, helping people out that literally don't have food and water because of the devastation. So thank you for that. Um, we have a lot of things, uh, again, as we're in the fall, things starting up. So. Um, Hopefully the last, maybe the last week that we'll run through some slides as these ministries get started up. But if you'll put those up for us. First of all, tomorrow night, the Ladies Fellowship, the monthly fellowship, the first for the fall kicks off at Jenny Malone's house. Okay, stand up, Jenny, just real quick. Um, Jenny, what time is that? 7 o'clock. There's her address. There's Jenny. And if you have any questions, just uh, run her down. Well, not literally, but maybe uh, talk to her after church. Okay, next, please. This is a multimedia event. You like the graphics on these slides? It's pretty fancy, isn't it, uh, a la 1960s? Okay, it's my fault. I sent them to Megan, and this is what I asked her to do. So uh, the ladies' Bible study is the next Monday night. That will start here. That's at 7 o'clock at the church. Spend three weeks in uh, Titus and then go into True Woman 201 Interior Design and spend 10 weeks there. And again, that'll be on the rhythm of 
of a, a ladies fellowship once a month this uh, that's on the first monday of the month is that right jenny every month the ladies fellowship yes. yes first monday of the month and then the other mondays are the bible study next please click click all right and save the date september 26th young marriage young means if you're under 40 there's going to be a young marriage event if you do that all right what else do we have up there small groups they start tonight Drum roll, please. We've got a couple, and, and, and if you're here this morning, as I call your name, small group leader couple, if you'll stand up. Jeff and Sue Felberg, I think, in the back. There's Jeff back there. Jeff, uh, meeting, if you, okay. Jeff, what time tonight, since you're tonight? 6.30 at Chad and Wendy Donnelly's. If you don't know where that is, see Jeff after church. Matt and Sarah Hobbs, are we here this morning, Matt and Sarah? Over here in the wing, what time? False alarm. First and third Sunday nights, so we're not meeting tonight. It'll be next Sunday night. Okay, we don't care what time. Sit back down. We do care, but that'll be next week. Uh, Justin and Holly Bertram. Justin and Holly, stand up. Tuesday nights. I'm not going to ask you what time because they can contact you between now and then, okay? Thank you so much. Dwayne and Deborah Velez. Okay, there's Dwayne. Great, and y'all are meeting this week? Justin and Holly, y'all are meeting this week? Okay, Dwayne, thank you. Uh, the Majors, John and Julie Majors, stand up. Right over here. All right. The Bakis, Chris and Sandy, are you here this morning? Chris is over here on the wing. You're meeting this week? Okay, 6.30 Thursday at the Bakis house. You can see Chris. And finally, the Quos, Jeff and Mari. Here's Mari. Okay, and you're meeting this week? Great. All right. I think that's it. Megan, is that, uh, I think that's all the slides we've run through. Thank you for your patience with this. We'll try not to do that again next week. Well, last week, Bob took us through an introduction in the book of Colossians. We're starting in that. Uh, we're digging in this morning into that, verses 1 through 14. And I know we did this last week. We had a responsive reading of verses 1 through 14. We're just going to have a, a congregational reading where we'll all read all the verses of 1 through 14 this morning. We're not going to do this every week. But as the fact that we're, we're jumping into the book and really starting to dig into those past, that passage, I thought it would be good to re-familiarize ourselves with it once more. So let's stand up, and before we sing, let's all read together verses 1 through 14 of Colossians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he's a faithful minister in Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy. Give thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
Amen. And you can stay uh, standing with us. We're going to join our voices and praise the Lord together. Let me just read this, um, this nugget of truth from Psalm. Psalm 92, verses 1 through 4. It says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night, to the music of the lute and the harp, to the melody of the lyre. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. As I was uh, thinking about this psalm this morning, I, I think it would read for my life, it would, say, it would say, It's good to give thanks to the Lord, and I declare his steadfast love on Sunday mornings, and his faithfulness sometimes at night. Uh, but what uh, David, the psalmist, is laying out for us is a pattern of how to live our lives, and that is wake up in the morning and sing praise to God and declare his steadfast love, and at night, remember his works throughout the day and declare his faithfulness. So we're going to sing of his steadfast love and his faithfulness together. Above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise with a mighty hand, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn.
the glory, great things He hath done. So loved He the world that He gave us His Son, who yielded His life and atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. together as we confess our sins this morning before our God. Our Father, we've come this morning to worship you and to have our lives realigned by your Spirit as we look together at your Word, which we confess is living and active and powerful, and we want it to be living and active and powerful in our lives today. As we come, Lord, we are freshly aware that you are the God who who promises rest and peace for our souls, and yet we are the people who are restless and troubled. We lack the rest and peace we long for, not because you withhold it, but because we look other places. We fail to come to you when our souls are restless and when we lack peace. You promised us that you'll not withhold any good thing from us. You are the source of life, and we ought to love dwelling in your presence more than anything else on earth. But we search for satisfaction, the thing for which our soul is thirsty. We search for it in stuff. We look for it in food and drink. 
or in drugs or in gadgets or in goodies. Or we think a nicer house or a nicer car or a newer outfit or a better looking body is going to deliver that for which our soul longs. Or we turn to other people, to our spouse or to our family or to our friends, and we expect that they will deliver uh, what our soul needs, that they will treat us in a way that uh, we will find peace and rest. We think our happiness and our contentment uh, comes from them, and we get entangled in how others act toward us and end up making them uh, the source of our joy. Lord, forgive us for looking for contentment and for rest for our souls in anything or anyone other than you. Forgive our shallow temporal thinking. Forgive us when we find ourselves seduced by cultural values, believing the lies of the enemy. Help us to come to you when we are weary and heavy laden because you have promised us rest. And your promises are yes and amen. And we ask now, Lord, that you would bring to our minds and speak to us by your Spirit. Show us any hidden sin that we might need to confess to you this morning or any hidden sin we need to confess to others as well. mercy on us, we pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And now if you'd stand and hear again the promise of God, grace and forgiveness as we affirm that forgiveness is found for all who are in Christ. Hear the word of the Lord through the prophet Ezekiel who said, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. From all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put in you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land and I will, that I will give to your fathers. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. Thanks be to God. Excelling joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Breathe, oh breathe thy loving spirit into every troubled breast. Certainly return and never, never more. 
without ceasing glory in thy perfect love finish this thy new creation pure and spotless let us be let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in me change from glory into glory till in heaven we take our place our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. We introduced uh, this next song a few weeks ago, um, so if it's still new for you, feel free to just listen and then join in when you can. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you. And to know so little else I need you. Oh, how I need Oh, how I need you. Oh, how I need you. Lord, I find you in the seeking. Lord, I find you in the doubt. And to know you is to love you And to know so little else I need you Oh, how I need you Oh, how I need you Oh, how I need you Lord, I find Every day that my life before your glory woven in your threads of grace I need you oh how I need you oh how I need you oh how I need you Oh, 
of our heart be acceptable in your sight we pray O oh lord our rock and our redeemer amen take a minute and greet those around you before we begin our service say hi to the folks who are nearby Have a seat. Before we... Um, I've lost control. Yes, lost control. Before we turn our attention to God's Word this morning, I'm going to ask Jeff Felberg to uh, come up, and I'm going to ask the... Uh, the elders and uh, going to ask the deacons who are here this morning, if you guys would all come up as well. We are installing Jeff as our newest deacon at Redeemer, and uh, this has been a process where his name was advanced to us, and we spent time praying and talking with Jeff and with Sue about the responsibilities of a deacon. L let me just say this. In a lot of churches, the, the office of, of deacon or the role of deacon winds up being kind of a glorified maintenance man and finance chairman. And while these guys who serve us as deacons do tend to some of those things, the bigger and more important responsibility they, that they have is to care for the, the, the tangible, physical needs of people in the church, people who are hurting and distressed, who have needs. And it's not for them necessarily to wind up doing all that work, but it's for them to stir you up so that we make sure that the work gets done, because we all pitch in and make that happen. Uh, Jeff, uh, we met with Jeff a couple of weeks ago uh, with Jeff and Sue and uh, confirmed that they feel called to this, that they meet the qualifications for this. And uh, so this morning, um, you haven't had anybody come to you and, and give you a knockout punch, have you? I know nothing. Okay, we, 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 we invite you all regularly to speak up if you know of any reason why a man is not fit to, uh, to serve. And nobody has done that over the last couple of weeks, and we're glad for that. So we're just going to gather around Jeff and put hands on him, and uh, I'll pray a prayer of, uh, of installation. So Jeff, just step up here, and guys, if you get around him and just put your hands on him, we can pray together for him. Would you bow, bow with me and join me in prayer? Father, we're grateful when you set apart men and women to do special work in your body. We're grateful for uh, 
all of the labor that is done here as a part of this church for the way that small group leaders and Bible study leaders and children's leaders all serve us. And now, Lord, we, uh, we come with grateful hearts that you've set apart Jeff for this special work of service as a deacon. We ask that you would uh, strengthen him in his inner man, help him to walk faithfully and humbly before you, help him to embrace this role and these responsibilities with joy and with gladness, not as one under compulsion. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would delight in his service and that we would be uh, ministered to by his ministry. Thank you for those who have gone before, for the other deacons, for Chad and for Keith and for Don. And I just pray that um, as Jeff joins that group and that team, that there would be, uh, there'd be cohesiveness and there'd be great love for one another and just a, a, a great serving together. Um, so keep your hand on Jeff. Keep him uh, walking in your ways in faithfulness to you and in service uh, to you and to us. We ask it in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Now, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to Colossians, the book of Colossians, chapter 1. We are uh, in the second week of what is going to be a multi-month study through this book. This will probably take us up to the first part of the year, and I have to begin this morning with a bit of confession, but I don't think I'm the only one here who will have this to confess. I do not think of myself as a particularly gullible person, but I have been known on occasion to order things that I see advertised in the middle of the night on infomercials on television, okay? <laughs> now, I just, I would like to see the hands of anybody in the room who can say, I have never called in and ordered and as seen on, oh, really? Oh, this, okay, put, how many of you, how many of you are willing to admit that, that you have, like me, done this? All right, just, <laughs> really? Oh, <laughs> Okay, so there is nobody here who can tell me if that thing for the headlight lamps really works and makes them, does, what? It does not? So you know. Okay, now see the truth is coming out. No, you bought it at the auto parts store, right? Well, I fixed them with sandpaper. Oh, sandpaper. Okay, all right. Well, we'll try that next time. Does anybody know if that hose that expands and contracts really works? Anybody know? Yes, it does? No, we got we got a yes we got a yes and a no in the same row back there. All right, how about the Sham Wow? Come on, some of you bought the Sham Wow years ago, didn't you? We got some Sham Wow folks back there. The uh, Hurricane Spin Mop. You've seen that one? Just looks awesome to me. Who now? Seriously, who owns a Snuggie? Come on. Okay, we got some Snuggie people here. And, and we'll go real old school. Anybody ever buy a pocket fisherman? Did you ever have a pocket? You had a pocket fisherman? Or the Vegematic? It slices, it dices, it makes perfect julienne fries. You remember this, don't you? Now, I do have experience. Okay, here, here are two things. I, I have the pet egg. The, you know, the pet egg? It's basically a cheese grater for your feet is what it is. It's what it is. And it cleans the dead skin. It's what it is. And then Flex Seal. I have bought a can of Flex Seal and used it on some corrugated metal, and it worked, okay? It stopped the leak, just like the guy said it would do on TV. Now, the, the reality is most of the stuff I've, I've bought like that looks really good on the infomercial, but you get it home and what? It just is, it's not very good at all. It looks amazing, but it's much less amazing when you get it home. And the reason I'm bringing... You're wondering, where is the connection to Colossians, right? The, the heart of the book of Colossians, here's what's going on. There is a small church in the Lycus River Valley in Asia, Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. This church was founded on the gospel, on Christ, and over the last five years as this church has grown, people have come along and they have said, here's what you need to make your church experience, to make your, your God experience complete. You need Jesus plus some other stuff. And they have, they have uh, had their own infomercials for, basically for three different things that have been, been peddled to this church. 
One has been what's called Gnosticism. It was the, the heresy that emerged in the first century, Gnostic from the Greek word gnosis, which means to know. Gnosticism was if you have the secret knowledge, if you have the, the uh, inner workings, if you know the right things to chant and to say, it'll take you deeper in your walk with Jesus. The second group were the mystics who said you need, you need experiences, you need euphoric experiences, you need to be in a state of heightened consciousness. There may have been drugs and other pharmaceuticals involved in mysticism, but you need visions and you need these kinds of things in order to go deeper with Jesus. And then the third group were the legalists who said, if you really want to have a walk with God, you've got to do this and this and this and this and this, most of it based on Old Testament culture. And the, the letter we're studying this fall is a letter where the Apostle Paul writes to this church that he's never been to. He doesn't know these people, but he's heard about the church from their pastor who he mentored, a man named Epaphras. He's heard about what's going on, and he writes to this church, and he says, you don't need legalism, you don't need Gnosticism, you don't need mysticism, you need Jesus. You need to keep your eyes focused on Jesus and the gospel and the fullness of of all that God has for you is there. You don't need a late night infomercial selling you some Jesus plus anything. You need Jesus. Uh, Paul is writing this letter to, to make it clear to these people that they should not be looking to add anything to their worship experience. We're going to read, we just read the first half of chapter 1 during our call to worship this morning. And these verses, verses 3 to 14 are where Paul is explaining to this church how he prays for them regularly. And as I meditated on this passage this week, a couple of things jumped out at me. The first thing that jumped out at me was the fact that Paul's prayer life is much better than mine. I'm always praying for you. I constantly pray for you. I'm always remembering you in my prayers. He doesn't even know these people, but he has love for this church that he had a part in planting by discipling their pastor, and he's praying regularly for them. The other thing that jumped out at me is that Paul is zeroing in on what are the fundamental foundational aspects of what it means for a, for a person or for a church to be gospel-centered and Christ-centered. What, what are the essentials of a walk with Christ? And, and just back to this issue of, of his prayer life, as, as he talks about how he prays, uh, he is giving an indication in his prayers about what matters most to him. And you stop and you think about it. Anytime you pray, what you're praying really is a confession of what really matters to you. Uh, and and it, it's also a confession of whether you believe God is actively involved in the things that really matter to you. Otherwise, why would you pray, right? If you don't think God is actively engaged, why would you go to him and, and verbalize to him the things that matter to you. Now, now hear me on this. Your prayer life or your lack of a prayer life is a good indicator of what matters to you and whether you think God's involved. If one of you were to come up to me after the worship service today and say, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to get a new job and would you just, would you pray for me that I might get this new job? Well, if, if I said, yeah, let, let's pray about that. What I say next is going to be a good indicator of two things. How well do I understand who God is? Do I understand who I'm talking to? And the second thing is, what's really on my heart as it relates to you getting this job? Am I praying for God's grace in your life, for, for peace, to, for understanding that he is in control and, and that he's guiding your path? Or am I just praying that you get what you want? This is, uh, this is a good diagnostic on what's going on in our understanding of God, his ways, his purposes, and whether or not we think he's engaged in life. So let's look together at, at chapter 1, see what Paul can teach us about prayer and what Paul teaches us about what's at the essence of, uh, of what it means to walk with Christ. Look at verse 3. Paul starts by saying, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for the saints because of the hope that is laid up for you in heaven. Now just stop right there. A lot of things just in those first couple of verses. Paul is first of all saying that he understands that when good things are happening in the church or in people's lives, God's responsible for that. We always thank God for the good things we hear about you. He says, when I see good things happening, I know who to thank for that. 
Not you. I mean, you, you have a part to play in that, but ultimately it's God at work in you and you're responding to God's goodness. He's also reminding them that the God that they're praying to is the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in a pagan culture, you have to remind folks, there are lots of people saying there are different gods. The God we're talking about is the God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And God and Jesus have this kind of intimate family relationship. And somebody who's coming along to you and saying, Jesus is an angel, or Jesus is a celestial being, or Jesus is just one exalted being, saying, no, this is God who is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. They are family. Paul has never met these people, as I said, but he's heard good things. And the good things he's heard about these people ought to be true about Christians in every church, in every place, in every time. And, and the three things are three words that are familiar to us. They're words we hear Paul talk about over and over again. He is thankful for their faith, for their love, and for their hope. Faith, love, and hope. These three qualities are at the heart of what he's, uh, he's thankful for. We're so used to hearing these words that we forget how fundamental, how foundational faith and love and hope are to our walk with God. One pastor, Kent Hughes, says, faith, hope, and love are apostolic shorthand for genuine Christianity. You want to know if somebody is really a Christian? They say they're a Christian. You want to know if they're really a Christian? Do you see faith, love, and hope? If you don't see that, there's reason to question their profession. If, if you see one but not the other, there's reason to wonder. Now, you may see them in greater or lesser degrees, but there ought to be some, some aspect of faith and hope and love present in a person's life. Dick Lucas, who's a British pastor, agrees. He says this, the three qualities are the hallmarks, the proper evidences of a work of God in the soul of a man. More than this may not be required in assessing the worth of a believer's claim to be a true child of God. You want to know if somebody's walking with God? Do they have faith, love, and hope? And let me just add to what Dick Lucas said. If there's less than faith, hope, and love, you have reason to question whether their claim is a bogus claim. So let's talk about those three things, faith, love, and hope. Again, they're familiar concepts, but I just want to make sure we're really thinking through what this is all about. What does this mean? Faith. When Paul mentions faith, love, and hope, he always mentions faith first. Sometimes it's faith, hope, and love. Sometimes it's faith, love, and hope, but it's always faith because faith is the starting point for everything. Without faith, what does the author of Hebrews say? It's impossible to please God. If you don't have faith, you don't have anything. This is elemental. It's foundational. And faith is, we tend to think that faith means just believing something really hard. If I just really believe, how many of you have seen the old miracle on 34th Street? Okay, so the one with, who is it Natalie Wood? Natalie Wood's the little girl in the movie. And at the end of the movie, she, she, you know, Santa has come to her and say she just needs to believe. And so she's riding in the back of the car. She's going, I believe, I believe. It's stupid, but I believe. She's just trying to really muster up faith. And so we tend to think that faith is just kind of gritting your teeth, squinting your eyes and going, I believe, I believe. No, faith is less about your believing and it's more about the object in which you have faith. It, it's less about, I mean, I could say, I believe this chair is going to fly on its own, okay? And no matter how hard I try to believe that this morning, that chair is not going to fly on its own because the object of my faith is incapable of what I'm trying to believe. So it's less, when we talk about a person having faith, the real question is not how hard do you believe? The real question is, what's your faith in? What's the substance of your faith? When, when John G. Patton, who was a missionary in Scotland, was translating the scriptures to the people in the Outer Hebrides, the islands off Scotland, who had their own language, he translated the word faith. He worked with, he tried to think, what, what word do I use to describe faith? And he ultimately came up with the expression, to lean your weight against. Faith is leaning your weight. It's saying not just I have a hope that something's going to happen. I, I'm trying to believe really hard. Faith is believing something so that you can lean your weight against it. You'll, you'll bet your life on it. 
My friend, Pastor Crawford Loritz, uh, just wrote a book on the subject of faith. And he says, faith is God confidence. It is the confidence that God has made promises. You have confidence in his character and in his promises. And you act as if those promises are indeed true. You act as if you really believe that. Paul reminds this church that he is thankful to God because he sees that they have faith and their faith is in Jesus. And that's critical to the whole message of Colossians. Jesus is enough. Jesus is where your faith should be, where your hope is, the source of your love. Faith in him is what you need and it's all you need. So the question for us when we think about do we have faith is this question, not how hard are we believing, but do we live our lives acting as if what we really say we believe is true? We say we believe God's word is true. Do we live our lives acting as if when I read this, I, I'm going to do what it tells me to do because it's true. We, we live our lives saying that we believe that God is our source for, for our needs. Do we live our lives as if we believe God is the source and will supply what we need? We, we say that we believe that our sins are forgiven and that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Do we live our lives as if we believe that God really has forgiven our sins? And that he is not just waiting for us to trip up again so he can swat us. Do, do we really believe that, that God's ways are perfect? This, this is what faith looks like. And Paul says, you got it. I'm glad you do. And, and I'm thankful to God because I see faith in you. And if that faith is absent, now again, it's going to happen in greater or lesser degrees. But if you don't see signs of faith in a church in your own life, you ought to question, do I have a walk with Jesus? Do I trust him? Do I believe him? Faith is essential. They also have love. Faith, the second thing they have is love. Have you ever stopped to consider what prompts <clears throat> affection or service in you for another person? Because love is some combination of affection and sacrifice and service. It's a commitment to another person. It's sacrifice for another person. It's, it's affection for that person. Have you ever stopped to think, what causes me to feel that way about somebody or to act that way towards somebody? For most of us, we, are, we have affection for and we are ready to step out and serve people who are a lot like us. Which in some way is us saying, what I really like about you is that you are like me. And I really like me. So whenever I see anything that looks like me and you, I'm just drawn to that. I mean, utter narcissism, right? Paul says this group has love for all the saints. Now, we talked last week, saints doesn't mean that they love the departed who have gone before them and who lived good lives. Saints means all the brothers and sisters. This was a diverse culture, a diverse group of people. They were from different parts of the world, settled in Colossae. They were from different ethnic backgrounds, different nationalities, different languages, and they came together and they loved one another, even in the midst of their differences, because one thing that they had in common was more powerful than any difference they had. And what's that? They love Jesus. And when you all love Jesus, that trumps whatever else is in your background. That trumps skin color. That trumps your, your family heritage. That's, that trumps your, your background of any sort. Your love for Jesus is a higher drawing. It, it, really what it is, is instead of saying, I see... I see me in you, so I love you. It's me saying, I see Jesus in you, and I love Jesus, so I love you. That's what was going on in this church. And it's what ought to be going on in the heart of every believer, and it's what ought to be going on in a healthy church. There shouldn't be anybody who walks in here that would go, I don't know about them, right? And if you have those, those prejudices we're talking about brothers and sisters in Christ where we love the Jesus we see in one another and if there's something holding you back you got to go what's going on in my own heart we, we Kent Hughes says this he says when Christianity emerged in the ancient world a new thing had come 
a community held together not by geographical accidents or by common language or by the iron chains of a conqueror, but by love. The world wondered at this, and not a few were drawn to Christ. When people see the love that we have for one another, it's, it's an amazing thing. Paul says the reason the people in this church had faith and had love is because they had a hope. In fact, look, look at where he says that they have this hope, or they have this faith and love because they have a hope laid up for them in heaven. You ever stop to think just how powerful a thing hope is? Maybe you've thought of this, how powerful and devastating a thing hopelessness is. <clears throat> to live without hope, it will destroy you and defeat you. In fact, during World War II, the Germans operated a concentration camp in Greece where they kept Allied prisoners of war. The camp was the Hadari camp, and during the time they operated this camp in Greece, there were more than 21,000 POWs who were brought in and out through the gates of this camp. And in, in a short period of time, in less than two years, there were 2,000 people executed in this camp. And one of the things that the guards in this POW camp used to do is they'd get the prisoners together and they'd all have them dig a hole over here. They would want you to dig a six-foot hole here. And the prisoners would work all day digging the hole, getting the dirt out, and they'd be all done the end of the day. They'd come back the next day and the prison guards would say, now we want you to fill the hole back up. And the next day they do the same thing. Go dig a hole here. Next day, go fill it back up. Next day, go build this wall here. They go build the wall. Next day, go tear that wall down. The futility of just meaninglessness, of hopelessness. We're not producing anything. We're just here digging holes and filling them back up. That kind of hopelessness will sap a person of their life. You can't live long without hope that there's something beyond what you're dealing with in life right now. We see this as we work with married couples. When a husband or a wife start to lose any sense of hope that their marriage can be better than it is, that's, that's when the seeds of the dissolution of the marriage start to, to come in. But when you can sit down and say, look, I know things are, I know, I know you're in a bad spot right now, but there, there is hope for you. Just that spark of hope is enough to keep people going. The promise of the gospel is that the light and momentary afflictions that we deal with this, in this life are producing in us an eternal weight of glory. So however bad your life is today, the promise of the gospel is there's hope. And, and that hope might not be this year or this lifetime. But there's hope beyond the grave. There is hope in eternity. There is hope that when what Rick Warren calls the dress rehearsal of this life is over and when the, the play opens in, for real in heaven and goes on for an eternal run, we have a hope that we will have joy and blessing and peace and rest in that moment. And this hope, Paul says, is what it is that produces the faith and the love. When you have a hope that one day we'll see Jesus, one day we'll stand before him and he'll say to the faithful good and faithful servants, come in, well done. That hope can get you through a lot. That hope affirms your faith. That hope generates love. One commentator says when Paul refers to hope, he means this, Christians must always act with one eye on the ultimate goal or the horizon. I like that. That should be our posture. One eye on what God is calling us to here, one eye on eternity. That's kind of cross-eyed, but when, when you live that way, with one eye on, on what God's called you to and one eye on eternity, that shapes your walk and your life and your actions. I, I don't know if you noticed this, but in the newsletter this week where I, I printed the, the letter that we got from Justin and Rachel about their decision to go be in, in Texas, they had... They had some nice things to say about their time at Redeemer. Justin wrote uh, about evidence of grace that he saw in our church. He said, first, you love God. It's rare to find a church that is completely captivated by the Lord. Some churches you find, or some churches 
You might find a handful of members and some elders who love God with a passion, but at Redeemer it seemed that everyone we met had a deep and burning love for the Lord. You all spoke of the gospel's work in your own lives. You spoke of God with thankful and worship-filled hearts. Not just the elders who displayed a love for God, but you displayed the same love for Rachel and me. He said, second, you, you love each other. No backbiting that we observed, no gossiping about one another in our hearing. Whenever another person was mentioned, you spoke with grace and love and admiration for that person. You are a genuine family, and we were jealous to be part of a local body like that. Third, he said, worshiping with you made us excited about the great day when we'll worship alongside you again. Our trip to Little Rock made Rachel and me long for heaven. We deeply desire to spend eternity with you all singing praises to the Savior. We're grateful for the amazing opportunity to get a foretaste of what that might be like someday. We'll constantly look back to our time with you and we'll drive a desire for the future when we get to be with you for eternity in the presence of God. Now I read through that and I thought, you know what he's pointing to? Faith, love, hope. He, he's saying what Paul said to the Colossians, I thank God for what I see with you, Justin said. I, I saw it in our church. And, and I'm glad that somebody who came and spent some time with us, visited here, observed those things. But the question I have for me and for all of us is, do the people in your neighborhood see that in you? People at the job site, would they say, you know, he's a guy with faith, love, and hope. Something different about that guy. Do, do your family members see that? I, is, are these evidences of God's grace true about you? Not just when we gather to worship and we can kind of muster it up for a Sunday morning, but in everything we do throughout the week. Now, where does faith, love, and hope come from? How, how does that get implanted into the heart of a person? How is it that, is, is this something that you just have to gin up. You have to stir it up, manufacture it on your own. I don't want you to hear me saying, boy, okay, I'm lacking in love, so I'm going to go home and try to do my love push-ups and see if I can, you know, build the love muscle up some. Paul says to the Colossians that this love and hope and faith that we see in you came from the word of truth, the gospel. When the gospel was brought to you and when you responded and said, I think that's right. I think that's true. I think what you're saying about Jesus is true. By, by the way, just that act of believing was something that God was stirring up in the hearts of those people because it made no sense for them to believe that Jesus was who Epaphras was saying that he was unless God was doing a work in their heart. So they respond, they say, I, I think that's true. And they believe the gospel. And at that moment, there's a new birth that takes place in that person's life. And when that new birth happens, Part of what is planted in the soil of that new birth is faith and love and hope. And those seeds are there and they have to grow over time, but that's where it comes from. It's planted in your heart. Now we have to water it. We have to give it the sunshine. We have to develop those things, but that's where it comes from. Look at verse 5. In the middle of verse 5 it says, Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. And I'll just stop there to say the gospel, the good news Paul calls it the word of the truth. He's not saying this is just some uh, theoretical proposition. This is an historical event that you have heard about, that you believe the good news of what God's done, and it's the word of the truth. It came to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. I'll just stop there and say one Bible commentator I read said grace, if, if there's a one word description of the gospel, it's grace. The, the grace of God in truth is, is the gospel. God extends grace to us. He pours out grace. Verse 7, you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He's a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made it known, has made known to us your love in the spirit. So he says the faith and love and hope that I'm hearing about in your church that I'm I'm thankful to God for is evidence that the gospel is bearing fruit in your church and by the way it's also bearing fruit in the lives of churches all across the world. Christianity Paul wants them to understand is not a tribal religion, it's not an ethnic religion, it's not a national religion. They are used to, well, the people over here believe this, and the people over here believe this, and the people who grew up here believe this, and Christianity is spreading throughout the whole world. 
It's, it's happening in, in the Middle East. It's happening in Jerusalem and, and Judea and in Israel, but it's now spreading throughout Asia and into Europe. And this is, this is something different than the other religions of the world. And it's not happening because a conqueror came and took over your land and said, now we're going to put up pagan temples. It's happening because the gospel has power that no other religion has. He says it is a worldwide universal religion bringing faith and love and hope to people of every tongue and tribe and nation. It's happening in Colossae, but I want you to know it's happening around the whole world. And by the way, the same is true today. If you looked at a map of the world where Christianity is spread, where, where major world religions are, you would see that there are some geographic areas that are strongholds for Islam. There are some geographic areas that are strongholds for Judaism. But you will see Christianity is spread around the globe. Stronger in some places than in others, but 100 million believers in China? Paul is making a point here that the hearing and understanding of the gospel were all that was necessary for a church to have faith and love and hope and to, for that to emerge and to grow. You don't need to sprinkle on anything else other than than just the meditation on the work of God done in Christ in order for faith and love and hope to happen. You don't need secret knowledge. You don't need special mystical revelations. You just need the good news about the grace of God shown in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. When the gospel comes to a person or a church, when it's believed, it will bear fruit. In fact, one commentator said, just as a tree without fruit and growth is no longer a tree, so a gospel that bears no fruit will cease to be a gospel. We, we can expect, we can anticipate that when the gospel is believed, the response to that will be faith and love and hope being born in the life and the heart of a person. So Paul says, I'm grateful for the faith, love, and hope that I see in you. It's rooted and grounded in your understanding of the gospel and of God's grace. And he takes this opportunity to affirm to them Epaphras, who had visited, had met Paul in Ephesus, had been discipled by Paul there. This guy had, we don't know why he was in, in Ephesus, uh, probably there on business of some kind. He comes back and he becomes, I would presume, a bivocational pastor planting the church in Colossae that met in Philemon's house, but also planting the churches in Laodicea and Heropolis in the nearby area. He was, he was on fire for Jesus and he was going around planting churches. And, and what was happening is the false teachers were coming in, the Gnostics and the mystics and the legalists were coming in and they're saying, Who, who's this Epaphras? What are his credentials? Where did he go to seminary? What's, what's his training for this? How, how do you know you can trust what he's telling you? And Paul writes here and says, you believed what Epaphras taught you. And he is, by the way, a good fellow servant. He, he is one who is commissioned by me. He's putting his apostolic stamp on the work that Epaphras is doing. And then he, he moves from thanksgiving. He says, when we pray, we thank God for faith and love and hope and rooted in the gospel. He said, and here's what we pray for. Here's our intercession. So we have thanksgiving in verses 3 through 8. We have intercession in verses 9 through 14. Here's what we're praying for for you. Here's what we want to see happen with you. He says, first, we pray that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And by the way, he says, I pray for this regularly. From the first day I heard about you until today, I'm praying this for you over and over again. Now, apparently, the legalists and the mystics and the Gnostics were coming to the Colossians and saying, you know, Christianity will fill you part of the way, but you need some other stuff to fill you up the rest of the way. You need some other knowledge to fill you the rest of the way. Well, Paul is saying, I'm praying that you'll be filled with the knowledge of his will. You don't need to be filled with some secret knowledge. All you need to be filled up with is the knowledge of his will. I'm praying you'll be filled up with God. And by the way, he uses a word here. Now, I'm, I'm no Greek scholar, but I told you gnosis is the word that means knowledge. He uses a different word here. It's epinosis. It's, it uses that little modifier epi on the front of gnosis. And the difference between gnosis and epinosis is gnosis is knowledge that you have by information transfer. So I tell you um, the hogs lost yesterday and you didn't know that because, uh, uh, because you weren't watching TV yesterday. You now have that knowledge by, by information transfer. However, 
Mike, who was at the game, has it by epinosis, okay? He experienced the loss, and he knows firsthand what it's like. And it's one thing to hear that the Hogs lost in the newspaper. It's another thing to sit through the game, right? So this is the difference between gnosis and epinosis. Kent Hughes says, from Paul's perspective, the deep growing knowledge of Christ and his will was then and is still today of the greatest importance in the spiritual life of Christians. Let me say that again. A deep growing knowledge of Christ and of God's will is of utmost importance for Christians in their spiritual life. You want to know how your spiritual life can grow and develop, how it can be deep and rich. Here's how. Get to know God better. And, and if you're thinking, I, I think I know him pretty well, you have not yet begun to scratch the surface of the greatness of God. I mean, the women who, was it last year you went through Attributes of God study? You, you go through that study, and what happens is you get to know God better, it changes your life. But I can guarantee you, even going through that study, there's still so much more of God that you don't understand. There are, there are aspects of those qualities that you studied last year that you haven't plumbed the depths of yet. The more you know God, the more of a difference it'll make in your life. One of the books that was given to me right after I became a Christian back in the 1970s was a book that if you came to me at the end of the service today and said, what are your top five Christian books? This would be on the list. And if you came and you said, I've got a friend who's a new Christian and I'm looking for something that I can share with this friend to help them grow in their Christian life, what would you recommend? I would say, get a copy of J.I. Packer's classic book, Knowing God. Knowing God. It's a great book. Do you know that book? Are, somebody's, are, do you know that book? Is she reading the, are you reading that book? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah, it's, it's got some big words, but it's a great book book that will explain to you the character and, and, and uh, who God is. It was, it was instrumental in my life, but you know what? I can go back and read that book today, and it's, it's still good. It's still rich. It's still helping me understand and know who God is. Paul tells the, Phil the Philippians in the letter that he writes to them, he says, I had all kinds of religious training when I was growing up as a Pharisee, I was at the top of my class as a Pharisee, and I would take all of the religious training I had when I was growing up, and I would throw it in the junkyard in exchange for the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. This is how foundational this is to the Christian life. You know, the, some of us used to sing this old song, Knowing You. Jesus, knowing you, there is no greater thing. You're my all. You're the. That's, that's what Paul is saying here. I, I, we pray that you will grow in your epinosis, your experiential knowledge of who God is. Dick, Dick Lucas again says, the difference between gnosis and epinosis, uh, gnosis is special knowledge, and that usually leads you to conceit. Whereas the knowledge of God, epinosis, should lead to love for one another. <laughs> so, I mean, you can grow in knowledge and just get puffed up, but you grow in epinosis and what that'll generate is love for one another. So how do you get this epinosis? Well, you get it by not just hearing what we're talking about this morning, but by taking what we hear from the Bible and then doing it. It's in the doing that the epinosis comes. If I pass information along to you and you say, oh, okay, that's, that's interesting, that's true, that's different than if I pass the information along to you and you start to act as if that's true. It's in the acting that the deep experiential knowledge comes. It's not just sitting back and listening to it. Here's an example. Uh, before I ever needed any, any serious dental work done, I had people tell me, if you ever have to have anything serious done with dental work, get nitrous oxide. Okay. And, and I, so I knew that, that that was a good thing to ask for if you needed dental work done. And then there was one time when I had to have a crown put on where I needed nitrous oxide and they gave it to me. And there is a difference between the knowing about nitrous oxide because a friend tells you about it and experiencing nitrous oxide. Now every time I go to the dentist I go, boy, I hope I need something really bad. <laughs> I just want, yeah. So. <laughs> when, 
when you have the experience of, of growing in spiritual wisdom and understanding, when you're filled with that epinosis, you, you want more. You, you don't need anything else. You don't need some mystical anything. You just need Jesus. You realize how filling it is, how transformative it is. Paul knows that if they're going to grow in their experience of the knowledge and understanding of God, they won't be led astray by the Gnostics. So he says, I want you to be rooted in this. Another reason he wants them to grow in their experiential understanding of who God is, is because when they do, they will, look, look at the verse, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's how this cycle works. You grow in knowledge and wisdom and understanding. You start to live it out. It causes you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You please him. You bear fruit. Your epinosis increases. You have a greater, deeper understanding of who God is as you walk worthy and bear fruit. And the cycle just continues. You want to know how to grow in your understanding of God and his purposes for your life? Walk worthy. Live holy lives. Do what God says is live the right way, the way God tells you to live, and then bear fruit. And bear fruit means you share your faith with others, you evangelize, and you disciple people in your path. That's the bearing of fruit, spiritual fruit in your life. You love on people, you care for their needs, and you grow in your understanding of who God is. You do that, and, and you'll grow deeper. And Paul says uh, that the power to walk the kind of a worthy life comes from outside of you, not from inside of you. He says, I pray that God will strengthen you with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience and joy, giving thanks to the Father. We could dig a lot into just that verse. There's, it's a rich verse. But the, the heart of it is that the source of the power to accomplish what Paul's talking about. He says, when I pray for this to happen in your life, I'm praying because it's going to take the power of God to make it happen in you. It's not something you can manufacture on your own. You can't walk worthy on your own. You can't grow in your knowledge and understanding of God on your own. This is going to be a supernatural work of God in your life. And then he wraps up this prayer by reminding them of what the gospel has already done for them. And he says two things. He says the gospel has delivered you from something and it has qualified you for something. So it's qualified you for something and it's delivered you from something. What's it qualified you for? It's qualified you for your share of the inheritance as saints of light. It's qualified you to be in the will. You will get a share of the inheritance. In other words, you've been brought into the family of God. You are now in the line. You're going to be a, uh, an inheritor. Now, what does it mean that they're qualified to share in this? Well, let, let, me, uh, let me give you two different kinds of qualifications. If you wanted to run in the Boston Marathon, you would have to run, I, I, I don't know this, I don't have epinosis of this. I, I just have gnosis from their website. If you wanted to do this, you would have to run in a qualifying marathon. I think the Little Rock Marathon is a qualifying marathon. And based on your age group, you would have to have your race come in at a, at a time that is a, um, a superhuman time, as I looked at them last night, to run this race. You'd have to come in at that time, and even if you did, you would still not be qualified. You would have to submit your application with your qualifying time, and then they would wait and see if there were people who had better times than you, because there are only so many spots in the race. So if you ran the race at the right time, you would be qualified for the Boston Marathon, but you still wouldn't be accepted into the Boston Marathon until they signed off on you. That's one kind of qualification. Then there is a different kind of qualification. The IRS has something called the Earned Income Tax Credit. If you don't make enough money, if you make a low amount of money, you qualify for tax breaks. And you don't have to do anything more than just not make much money to qualify. Everybody who doesn't make much money qualifies. Okay? So you are qualified for this inheritance as a child of light. It's not a Boston Marathon qualification. It's an earned income tax credit qualification. If, if you're in Christ, you qualify. Nothing else has to happen. You, you are in line for the inheritance in, uh, in this, right? Paul is saying you're qualified to share in this inheritance, no additional steps. And the reason you're qualified is because Jesus met the qualifications for you. You're qualified not because you did something special, but because Jesus has already done what's necessary. Not only are you qualified, but you're delivered. And that's the next thing that he, he says in this. He says, you have been delivered from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of his son. Darkness, you know, is a metaphor in scripture 
for a lack of understanding, having your mind darkened, or for moral uh, impurity, having your hearts darkened is the idea that you're living morally impure lives. Imagine that you lived in a place that was full of people who had darkened minds and corrupted natures. Oh wait, you don't have to imagine that, do you? Because right? that's the place you're from. That's the kingdom you used to be a part of. Didn't have the understanding, living morally corrupted lives, that's your former citizenship. That's the kingdom you were living in, the kingdom of darkness. Last Monday, Marianne and I uh, took a day trip. We've never been to Mountain View, Arkansas. So we thought, we're going to go up to Mountain View. Now, they were not playing folk music like I wanted them to in the middle of the day on Monday afternoon. But we went up and, and just wanted to see what Mountain View, Arkansas is like. And while we were there, we drove north a few miles to Blanchard Springs Caverns. Who's been to Blanchard Springs? Raise your hand. Okay. It's a good day trip to go to Blanchard Springs. And the thing about Blanchard Springs, the, the, the caverns, that I, I always think this is cool in caves where they take you in the middle of the cave, they turn off all the lights, put your hand in front of your face, you can't see anything. And they say, it doesn't matter how long you stay in here, your eyes will never adjust because there's no light in here, you'll never see anything. Now imagine, it's cool for five minutes, but imagine they said, okay, we'll see y'all. We'll come back tomorrow and get you. Living in that darkness would not be cool, would not be fun, with a bunch of other people not being able to see if the next step is over the cliff, not being able to see your own face. That's the, the domain of darkness. That's a metaphor for what it's like to live with darkened hearts and darkened minds in this world. Paul says you've been delivered from that in Christ to the kingdom of his son. Paul wants these believers to understand in his prayer, when we pray for you for the love, faith, and hope, thanking God that that's there, when, when we uh, pray that you would grow in your understanding, this is, folks, he says, this is all you need. This is where you're going to find life. This is where your soul will be satisfied. What your soul longs for will be met in these things. The formula is this, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the formula. You don't need mystics, Gnostics, or legalism. And in fact, those things will destroy what Jesus is here to offer. And the reason we have the deliverance, and the reason we are qualified, and the reason we have the love and the faith and the hope, and the reason we can grow in knowledge is because Jesus has paved the way. In fact, it's the reason that every Sunday, as we gather together, we make the, the pinnacle of our worship time together coming up front to get the bread and the cup to remind us that what Jesus did and what happened on the cross is, is the most important thing that's ever happened in history. It's the pinnacle of our spiritual lives. It's where we find all we need. There's nothing special or magical about bread and what, what somebody called the sip and chip. That's what they called it, right? There's nothing magical about that. But the reminder that the broken body and the shed blood of Christ is the source of everything for us is what we do need. If you're here this morning with us as a visitor at Redeemer, uh, we want you to know that if you're a believer, if, you, if you've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His Son, if you see evidence of faith and love and hope in your life, if you are growing in your knowledge of who Christ is, you're welcome at this table. That's who's welcome here. Uh, whether, whether you're a member of the church or not, you're welcome to come and receive the elements. If you're here this morning and you have questions about this, or you're not sure that you know Christ, rather than coming and getting the elements, let's talk about what it is to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and to have that transforming experience that we've talked about here this morning. The way we do this is we're going to come down the outer aisles to receive the elements. We'll take the elements back to our seats, and in just a minute, we'll take communion together. So uh, why don't you take a few minutes, just uh, bow your heads, prepare your hearts to come, and then I'll call you to the table here in just a minute. <laughs>
are ready this morning, you can come.
these elements are reminders for us of what is most important. Jesus, as he met with his disciples on the night before he was crucified, took bread, and after he had blessed it, he broke it. He said, this bread is my body broken for you, and as often as you receive it, I want you to remember me. It's in remembering him and what he's done, what was accomplished through his death and resurrection, that we find our joy and our hope and our peace and our life, that we find everything our soul needs to be satisfied. And so, Lord Jesus, we do rejoice this morning as we come to receive this bread, rejoicing knowing that you have opened a new and living way for us. And we want to follow you in obedience. Thank you for your broken body, for the life it gives to us. We receive this with grateful hearts as we feast on you in our heart this morning. In the same way, after the meal was concluded, Jesus took the cup, and having pronounced a blessing, he passed it. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you receive this, remember me. And so, Lord Jesus, we do remember again this morning that there is forgiveness of sin, there is redemption for those who are in Christ. We thank you that your blood has made this possible. And so as we receive this this morning, we are aware that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. We feast on you in our hearts as we receive this with grateful hearts. Amen. If you'd stand, we will sing, Enter the, or, uh, Finish Then Thy New Creation, that verse from Love Divine, and then we'll uh, dismiss with a benediction. God, direct your steps this week and produce in you greater faith, greater love, and greater hope that we will one day be with him. Go in peace. Amen. Have a great week.